The African-American legend Sea Rays highlights the accomplishments of blacks in the areas as varied as politics, aviation, business, theater, literature, and religion. We will explore how African-Americans have succeeded in areas where they've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is my friend, Woody King, Jr., director of the New Federal Theater. Hi, Woody. How are you doing I'm glad to be here again, yeah. tell you about what we're doing in the state of black theater. <laughs> That's what we want to talk about. I've got some interesting things we want to talk about about okay. black theater, but let's start. It's 2006. Mm -hmm. Black theater has a long storied tradition. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen in 2006 with black theater? Okay, I always tell people when they talk to me about what's going to happen, what's the future of black theater. The future of black theater is exactly where black Americans are. Whatever the future of black Americans mm -hmm. are, that's the future of black theater. Mm -hmm. And I think we are in good shape. I think we're in good shape despite uh, racism, classism, mm -hmm. sexism, and all those isms that are against us. I think we are in good shape. And Why I'm, do you think we're in good shape, given the fact that we have a repressive administration, and given the fact that affirmative action programs are being destroyed, and given the fact that certain racist attitudes, particularly in the conservative media, are being projected. Why do you think we're in good because shape? Because the young people who are coming along today uh, have access to almost every kind of new technology, and they are using it. Mm -hmm. uh, they are using it in hip-hop. They are using it in radio, television, uh, all kinds of motion pictures. Uh, we have young uh, filmmakers who are making major, major breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. uh, people in theater are just flooding the mm -hmm. uh, New York and L.A. and London scene. Mm -hmm. And these are black people, some of them and most of them out of predominantly black universities. That's very interesting because what that says is that despite the media which says that African Americans are languishing, particularly after Katrina and so on, that there is a zeitgeist of hope mm -hmm. and energy in the young population. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Many uh, middle class black folks don't understand this. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that's the media, and part of it is that they don't come in contact with people like Woody King Jr. <laughs> right, right. But what these young people are doing, and, and it's amazing, uh, they are creating their own culture. Mm -hmm. They're taking the best of what existed and using it and moving on. I mean, whether you deal with hip hop in the old fashioned way or the new fashioned way, but hip hop is really an offshoot of rhythm and blues music, an offshoot of the black poetry of the 60s mm -hmm. and the black power movement, uh, the last poets and all those are now uh, uh, the major American rap artists. Mm -hmm. That is interesting because I know your son produced a hip hop musical. Did he yeah, not? yeah, yeah. Uh, and you had trouble <laughs> understanding what was going on there for a while. <laughs> right, right. But I, but I finally got it, you know. And but I was able to get a young uh, director choreographer who was just uh, getting ready to turn 25 to direct it and choreograph mm -hmm. it. He understood everything. He made it happen. Uh -huh. A young brother named Rajendra Maharaj. You know, this mixture of black and Caribbean and Haitian and all those kind of things, you know. So uh, it's a whole new culture. And this new culture is uh, um, peopled by the young people uh, out of these black, uh, predominantly black universities. Yeah, well, what about some of the theater programs, some of the white universities, programs that... Uh, I don't you think don't, too don't much think of them. I think they... Uh, White universities are basically there to perpetuate European and Eurocentric culture. Mm -hmm. And if you go into them, you really got to still come out and uh, uh, acclimate yourself with black American culture. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, they have no interest in Richard Wright, Ralph Ellison, mm -hmm. uh, even August Wilson and a lot of the white mm -hmm. universities. They are interested in uh, the traditional uh, Eurocentric uh, Russian literature of the past. As you say, arts, theater, and music reflect what's going on in the culture. Yeah. You gave an excellent explication of what's happening in black culture. Mm -hmm. In white culture, there is some tension about incorporating hip-hop. Some of the younger white artists want to do more of this. Mm -hmm. How much has that been influenced by black theater and black music? Well, one of the things that I noticed, whether you deal with Britney Spears, whether you're dealing with the new... Uh, young white artists, Eminem, uh, they are all uh, really produced by major young black producers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, uh, 
amazing how uh, the sound uh, that they uh, uh, come out with is a mixture of, you know, a little whiteness, but a lot of blackness. Mm -hmm. And so the I'm telling you, this culture is really changing fast, and it's really predominated by blackness, you know? Well, well one of the <coughs> criticisms of hip-hop has been given is that some of the music is misogynistic mm -hmm. and some of it is, emphasizes violence. Mm -hmm. uh, is that turning around now so that it's going more mainstream? Well, if you look at Russell Simmons, Russell Simmons even turned around. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if you look at uh, P. Diddy, he's turning around, you know. Uh, it's they are moving more away from that. I think that was to get attention. Uh, even Snoop Dogg now is uh, <laughs> turning around, you know. But uh, it's more that attention, that uh, gangsterism uh, that predominated the uh, culture early on was really to get attention. Most of those kids who said they were gangsters was Howard University graduates mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> Hampton and uh, Clark Atlanta University mm -hmm. graduates. You know? Now, but in a sense, wasn't that playing on the white community's view of black yeah, folks, yeah. that we are gangsters, we are thugs, we yeah. don't respect our women. And many people have been trying to move away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's been a lot of criticism of it, of course. How are we now? Is it more in terms of dealing with racial pride and male-female relationships and moving ahead? Or is there still some theme of the violence and the the sexism that has been in some of the early hip hop. Well, I think those people who are entering it use that to enter it. Once they get into it, they realize, oh wow, that well, that's not the way it is at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got to be able to do what I do well. I got to be well trained in it. I got to be well trained mm -hmm. in doing work in a studio, whether it's in a, a TV studio or a recording studio. Because the bottom line is, how do you deal with those? Uh, uh, engineering feats that uh, had been denied us for so mm -hmm. long, where you, a lot of times we had to do scratches, create our stuff from um, the back of, sell our stuff in the back of a car. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think what happened is those who people want, those people want to enter into whether it's black theater or uh, black music or rhythm and blues, they think it's a certain way. You know. And I think the white owners of these record companies and studios lead us to believe it's that way. And then we get in there, these young people are well educated. They, they don't take them long to say, oh, wait a minute, this is not the way it is. This is the way I can get out of this thing and get my mama a house, my daddy a house, and, you know what I mean, pay my uh, girlfriends uh, uh, some jewelry or something, you know. But, but after a while, once they get into that, uh, uh, Roscoe, it evaporates within two or three years. Agreed, but what does that say about a society that black folks have to act a fool, it used to be the minstrels, mm -hmm. have to act a fool and uh, cater to the stereotypes of whites? What does that say about us as a people that we have to do this? What does it say about society that causes us to do this? Well, I think that society, whether it's black theater, uh, hip hop, etc., those few people who make it who do very well, those few black people um, give an image of this ebony image of, jet image of white people are all around them mm -hmm. and uh, very few of these young people can get to them. They mm -hmm. have to go through white people to get to them. So they say, wait a minute, mm -hmm. I'm going to make it on my own. I'm going to, I mean, these people are not going to help me because mm -hmm. I can't get to them for them to help me. You know what I mean? So. Uh, by, you know, as Malcolm said, by whatever means necessary, um, these young people try to uh, attain a certain kind of uh, freedom ex of expression, uh, freedom of uh, economic freedom, uh, most of all economic freedom, mm -hmm. because, and get garnering those richnesses uh, that they see uh, our so-called leaders with, you know what I mean? But see, Woody King Jr. and the New Federal Theater have been doing this for years, mm -hmm. making opportunities for young African Americans, and not so young African Americans, who want to express themselves through the mode of theater. Mm -hmm. You've been able to survive. Mm -hmm. What has been your t the, the, uh, uh, the, the particular message that you've been able to send that attracts people to New Federal Theater and allows it to survive? Well, I think New Federal Theater is 
uh, has survived because it is a pass-through. Uh, I'm, uh, and we have been able to look at young writers who have early plays that, wow, if black people see this, they will appreciate you. Young uh, actors, whether it's Denzel or Sam Jackson or Lawrence Fishburne, if, young, if, if people see these brothers, they'll see that they are serious about what they're going to do. So come, and this door is open to you, this play is available to you, and if you're a director, whether it's Gil Moses, Michael Schultz, or, or Scott, or Antizaki Shange, this door is open to you. Now, that does not mean that they can go and make it very well and become very, very rich, and they're going to help this theater. They're not going to help the next person that comes along, they, because they are uh, nouveau rich, as they say. You know, uh, They think they're going to lose it next week. So uh, it is very, very hard to get any kind of continual uh, uh, support. So what I think I've been able to do is really look at it very realistically. I cannot make a living, whether uh, I want to or not, only doing the theater. I got to mm -hmm. do books. I got to do films. Mm -hmm. I got to go out and give lectures. I got to teach, you know. Mm -hmm. And the theater cannot support uh, uh, me the way a lot of people want their institutions to support them like white institutions support them. Uh, we don't have the kind of contributing income. Black people just don't have that kind of money to contribute year after year mm -hmm. to help this theater. Uh, this is not um, uh, the Manhattan Theater Club. It is not Lincoln Center or the Roundabout or any of those three or four or five million dollar institutions where the leadership and great staffs keep it going. You know, this is a small operation, that's what we choose to do. Now, you did say something that was very insightful. You said that many of these black actors, writers who become accepted and make some money do not spend a lot of time or effort bringing along someone else. No. Now, that has been the tradition of black educators, black ministers, to bring people along. Now, you gave the explanation that they're afraid they're going to lose something the next day, but that really is not an excuse. It's, it's kind of an insight that they don't have or we as a group don't press upon them. Mm -hmm. Occasionally a celebrity, I won't mention a name, will give a million dollars for something. But that's very, very seldom. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the heritage of a racist tradition that said that black folks really are one step away from losing what they have, mm -hmm. because these folks are not one step away yeah, from losing lose what, what they, they have. Right, right. Uh, I'm sure you've had some conversations with them about that. What kind of insights do you have on that? Well, my first uh, uh, conversations with, uh, of course, with a lot of highly visible artists, right? And um, these artists feel that they made it, uh, mm -hmm. so can the next person. They and made it, uh, in a sense, on their own, all of you although and others we, Although made that it. door was open there for them to walk That's in. exactly right. right. Uh, although uh, uh, they uh, really sympathize, uh, they really believe that most black institutions, whether they are 35 years old or uh, three years old, don't know how to handle money. And so... Uh, while they would give a white institution a hundred thousand dollars, they may give a black institution a thousand. Mm -hmm. While it costs me the same thing to pay an actor that the white institution pays, it costs me the same thing to pay for an ad in the New York Times or anywhere else. And of course, uh, uh, most of the media uh, is so uh, racist. They don't. I can have Ruby D in a play at my theater. The white media is not going to come and see her. But if she's in a uh, um, a play at that white theater, they will flood and give her all kind of awards. So it's like that kind of uh, 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 racism, if you will, uh, classism, uh, if you will, that uh, deny us access to the wider audience who would come and buy seats. If it wasn't for uh, shows like yours and uh, M. Hotep Gary Bird and certain black uh, uh, media, the black theater would be totally out of business. Well, one of the things I was thinking about, uh, and we talk about in this uh, African-American legends a lot, about the tradition or the heritage of, uh, of racism that has affected both the white community and the black community. 
So we internalize those beliefs, mm -hmm. those attitudes. Um, I'm reading a book now about Negro baseball leagues in the 30s and 40s and the struggles that they had. They were supported basically by black number writers mm -hmm. and white promoters and the tensions were. But part of that has to do with the fact that the larger white financial community, support community, is not open to them. What can we do to force that community to do a better job? Because it's not true that our organizations are, are poorly managed financially. We run out of money many times because we don't have enough money. Right, yeah. But what are some of the things that might be done to move that away? For, for example, you mentioned that many of the artists have white support staffs mm -hmm. surrounding them. Mm -hmm. and not that white people shouldn't be involved and don't have the skills, but what can we do to get more African Americans into those support staff positions to open up the, the playing field? Well, if you deal with uh, major television and Hollywood, that is controlled by white people. So in order for a star to enter into that world, he mm -hmm. has to acquiesce to certain rules of that game. Mm -hmm. So, and one of those, well, some of those rules are uh, business people, accountants, secretaries, etc., uh, are white. Now, is that a rule or is that something that happens by habit? Because we obviously have black business people, accountants, secretaries, computer specialists. Is it something that is because of the tradition or the contacts or the fact that we don't knock on the door hard enough? I think we're not going to do it very hard. That's not the issue. By, by we, I mean the collective African-American community in demanding this. Well, let, let, let's, uh, again, I don't think, uh, and I love these guys, Dick O'Neill or um, Chenault or Parsons at those companies, are in any, in any kind of sense helping black Americans. Mm -hmm. They are, uh, in a sense, uh, really perpetuating a Eurocentric kind of uh, uh, domination and mm -hmm. uh, what they've learned how to do is do that and they're mm -hmm. not going to get that position as CEO unless they do that mm -hmm. so now knocking on doors uh, whether I'm the uh, best computer expert in the world I'm going to be sent to the computer department that person who's running that department they don't know me my black face means absolutely mm -hmm. nothing to them mm -hmm. They're going to bring someone in there that they play golf with, that they're more familiar with. I'm not going to be able to talk to uh, uh, Dick Parsons or Chenault or O'Neill, you know? Well, this is January. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Martin Luther King's birthday was on January 15th, a yeah. national holiday. Martin Luther King and the people who worked with him did change this nation. Well, they without... broke segregation, legal segregation. They open some doors. Yeah. Now, the, the next level is widening that door. Mm -hmm. And what you describe undoubtedly is correct. But I was thinking, why can't the collective African American community begin to say, look, we deserve more of the pie. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed that whenever we say that, white folks say you had enough. Mm -hmm. Not all white folks, some mm -hmm. white folks. Mm -hmm. So what is it? Is it is it our consciousness isn't as great or is it that our political power isn't as great? What, what do you think? Well, uh, I, uh, my, when, you, when you speak of uh, Dr. King who and uh, Sister Rosa Parks and all those people who changed our lives uh, and you look at... Um, a Martin Luther King march today. That march, by its very nature, includes all these white people saying they have the dream too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, once that march is over, they go back to their respective community. They go back to their respective jobs, and it might be one black people work, black person working there. Mm -hmm. It's not. Uh, so what happens is the infiltration, the integration of uh, our lives are so uh, perverse in a way that it uh, throws us off. Now, uh, what can we do? We can protest. Uh, we can uh, back people like Al Sharpton. We can back people like uh, Charles Barron who are going to protest anything that's out of line. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about um, uh, whatever we want to about 
uh, black theater. I am going to do those things that make black people comfortable. Mm -hmm. I am not interested in uh, really perpetuating a Eurocentric culture. Well, speaking of black theater and its okay. contributions, <laughs> okay. uh, over the past 50, 60, 70 years, black theater has made major contributions to increasing uh, awareness of both blacks and whites about our condition. Mm -hmm. If I would ask you, what do you think the three most influential black plays in the 20th century were, what would your answer be? Oh, God. Uh, first, I would say uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry with her breakthrough play, uh, A Raisin in the Sun. Yeah, it's like the Jackie Robinson of theater. Right, right. right. And I would have to say the play I produced for colored girls who considered mm -hmm. uh, suicide when mm -hmm. the rainbow is enough by Ntozaki Shange. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would have to say uh, a breakthrough play was Dutchman by Amiri Baraka. Mm -hmm. And that would stand alongside uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone mm -hmm. uh, by August Wilson mm -hmm. and Ed Bullins is uh, In New England mm -hmm. Winter and In the Wine Time. Those are uh, major, major American works by uh, black American writers. Mm -hmm. Ironically, two are by women and the rest are by men, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but uh, uh, it's hard to say uh, what is uh, the most influential mm -hmm. because uh, influence uh, really is controlled by Pulitzer Prizes. Mm -hmm. uh, like we know that uh, Toni Morrison has won a Nobel, Wally Schrink has won a Nobel, Derek Walcock has won a Nobel. Uh, but then you would say, oh wow, in any European classroom, how many of you read uh, uh, Tony's work? Well, mm -hmm. we, we haven't gotten around to it. Yeah, uh, where, right. you, know, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, or Wally Schrink or, or uh, Derek. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't read these people's poetry and works, you know. Uh, they bestow uh, beautiful awards on us and then uh, uh, ignore us. One, one, one interesting thing I just want to say um, is the Hollywood motion picture system and the critical uh, reaction to that system will say to an actor, you are one of the finest actors I've ever seen. There is no one better than you. The Academy Award comes. You say, well, why didn't you vote for him? Oh, well, I mean, he wasn't up to. But in that moment, the actor is one of the five, but to vote for him to get an award mm -hmm. is totally something else because an award is, is a perpetuation of uh, the energy and artistry of black people. Well, of course, what you're saying, we've been saying all this uh, discussion, is that the world has got to change. Yes that the world, I think, will change. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's necessary for change is awareness. Mm -hmm. And what you try to do in the uh, New Federal Theater and what we try to do with African American Legends is to increase the level of awareness, mm -hmm. right. to des describe it like it is. Absolutely. Because many times, uh, those of us who have public positions do not always say exactly the way it is. Right. And this country is in, in a crisis at a, at a pivotal point. The world, the global world, predominantly non-white, mm -hmm. the global world, which has resources, is beginning to look at America and say, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And the fact that we only give a little bit of money for AIDS in Africa, the fact that we're not doing anything significant for people in Katrina, says to the world, Look, the United States is at a crisis. Mm -hmm. What are some of the plays that are reflecting that as you see through New Federal Theater and other groups? Well, the play that we have coming up, uh, Real Black Men Don't Sit Cross-Legged on the Floor, mm -hmm. it's an unusual piece, about, it's a journey piece, mm -hmm. where uh, this young man travels from the Civil Rights Movement in the South to the North during uh, uh, the 60s, to Africa, to the Caribbean, to uh, Europe, mm -hmm. and back to the South and thrown in back to New York. Who wrote that play? Uh, a brother named Christopher Malik Brown. Mm -hmm. uh, it's directed by a sister named Passion, mm -hmm. uh, Rhonda Passion. Excellent piece. Excellent. How can our audience find out about this? All they have to do is call us. Call us at 212 353 1176. And New Federal Theater is located at. at 
466 Grand Street. That's where the play is, 466 Grand Street on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. In Manhattan. Just <laughs> so this play, uh, this journey play, is about a, a black man coming to awareness that uh, uh, the conversations in Africa uh, with his people are no different than really the conversations in England with his people or in the South with his people. Sounds like a great play, uh, Woody. We've completed our discussion today, but okay. I want to thank you for your very insightful views on black theater, and good luck to Woody King, Jr. and the new Federal Theater. Thank you for having me, man. Yeah. You know, this is wonderful. New Federal Theater's longevity is an achievement in and of itself. The missions of the New Federal Theater are to present outstanding new plays by black, Asian, Hispanic, and Jewish playwrights. Come join us as we honor Woody King Jr. and New Federal Theater's 35 years of spirited theater and pioneering art. Sunday, February 13th, 3 p.m. Town Hall, 123 West 43rd Street. Call now, 212-838-2660. 212-838-2660.